I'm Julian Kang, and uh, as uh, Professor Bluth uh, told you, I'm from uh, originally from South Korea, and the, uh, this is the, my Korean name, which is obviously different than uh, Julian Kang. It's, uh, it sounds like Kang Ho Young. That's my name, and we put their name at the beginning of the name. So Kang over here. Is my third name and became Kang when I came over to Texas. Anybody knows where South Korea is at by any chance? This is just something that I presented to my students already. So, you guys bear with me for a little north 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's very close to North Korea. You know, yeah, South Korea is kind of located right here. Okay. And then it has the border with the North Korea. And then I guess the Korea is kind of, you know, kind of a more famous to you guys with this guy, right? <laughs> and then uh, this is basically representing uh, you know, the, the other part of the Korean Peninsula. But in South, I guess this guy is more famous to you, know, you guys because of his song. Open Gangnam Style! So this is basically how South Korea is born to you guys. And then this is the city that I was born, which is the second the largest city in South Korea, which is the harbor. And then this is the university that I went to in 1982. I'm a civil engineer. I studied <coughs> civil engineering. And then I went to uh, the Master uh, School of the Civil Engineering <coughs> of the same university to uh, study uh, the the concrete material to see how concrete material, material can sustain under a dynam dynamic loading conditions, you know, stuff like that. So I went to civil engineering of Yonsei University, and then uh, I did uh, my, my master's work uh, at the same school, wrote a paper about the cumulative damage of a plain concrete under dynamic loading conditions, okay? And then this school is basically located in Seoul, and then Seoul happens to be one of the largest cities in Asia. Um, and I have some video clip, but we don't have much time to watch the video. So we'll be moving on. Uh, after graduating from uh, uh, school, I went to a company called Tepco ENC, which is the company, the only company in South Korea designing a nuclear power plants. So I was working for this company for 10 years, designing uh, nuclear power plants. And then what we designed is different <coughs> from the one that uh, was going on in Japan and got exploded. So what we designed is a safe. <laughs> what they designed, I don't know. Okay. And then uh, this is uh, uh, one of the projects that I was working on. And then while I was working on this uh, for this company, I happened to be in charge of creating a 3D CAD based information management system, which we call as IPIMS, Integrated Plant Information Management System. And then this <coughs> system does uh, 3D modeling, producing two dimensional uh, CAD, checking clashes. You know, coming up with the bill of materials, you know, stuff like that, which is very similar, almost 99% identical to the building information modeling technology that you guys are talking about. So I've been talking about this thing, building information modeling thing, uh, since 1993. So it's been more than 20 years for me to say the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I was like this when I was in the industry, working on one of the you know, projects. And then after working on this company for nine, ten years, I came over to Texas a University to pursue my PhD over civil, working on construction engineering and management. And what I did was I was developing web-based, a four-dimensional visualization tool to prove that this web-based application is going to enhance our communication in the course of a construction. Then I came over to Construction Science Department in 1990, in 2001. And then since then I was working with many toys, uh, including uh, Google Glasses, and then uh, uh, the BIM cave uh, that you're going to uh, see in a moment. And then I happen to be holding many uh, professorships and the current one is you know, the Facebook uh, Maker Homes Professor 
is the one that I'm currently holding. And I've been also working with the uh, industry. Uh, and then I established you know, BM Texas Alliance you know, with those people. As you see, uh, we have a GSA, uh, US Army Coast Jet Engineers, the city of Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth. We get together. And then we are still working together to see how we can advance the use of the building information modeling and other technologies. And June 10th this year in Cali Station, in our campus, we'll uh, host uh, another conference which we call as uh, Smart Technology Conference 2016 for innovative design, construction, and the facilities management. Okay, so June 10th is the day uh, uh, for the conference that I'm working on. Uh, this is the um, the, uh, the previous uh, conference that I hosted in 2012. Last year, I was uh, presenting, I was hosting another conference in College Station for educators from all over the places in the United States. And then this is our second uh, interdisciplinary uh, class project that I'm working with uh, Professor Booth and uh, Dr. Clayton. Uh, the one we worked last year was Academy, uh, River Academy uh, project, and then this is the, these are students who are giving uh, the final presentations. And then most likely, this is what you will end up doing at the end of the semester. You will be, uh, you will be part of a team uh, with students from uh, architecture and construction science department, and then you all uh, will work on together on the same project. And then uh, at the end of the semester, we will expect you guys to uh, <coughs> give us an excellent presentation like they are doing here. I'm interested in RFID, uh, radio frequency identification. Long story to tell, so you can skip. And also, I'm interested in uh, the robotic total station, which is basically a robot. Uh, it's a total station, but it's a robot following you. And then uh, I'm interested in this technology because it can be easily combined with the building information modeling to uh, enhance the project control practices of the job site. Uh, some video clip, but we can move on. And I'm also interested in uh, photogrammetry. Uh, picking up a 3D model using photos. And then uh, some of you guys have you know, been to uh, Francis Hall already uh, after renovation was finished. But this is the, the 3D model we picked up before renovation uh, got started. So take a look at what was like, what was the Francis Hall like in before the renovation started. <laughs> that we created from taking pictures. Okay. Other technologies I'm interested in, uh, I'm also interested in uh, you know, augmented reality or mixed reality. This is a, a factory helmet, uh, one of the uh, advanced uh, you know, kind of a, a, a mixed reality devices that the industry is about to use if the price goes down. It's too much expensive at the moment. Other toy that I'm interested in is the drone, obviously. We are running one uh, project going on right now to develop uh, an application that will control the location of a drone so that we can easily monitor the construction activities using this <coughs> drone without having to manually control the drone. So my uh, aim is to be able to automate the flight of a drone to monitor the job site so that you guys can easily use it <coughs> to learn how to use it. Okay? And then uh, uh, the images that the drone is picking up is uh, somewhat beyond your imagination. So take a look at one example that I got uh, from last year. So this is the video that I picked up from drone in a very, very windy day. See how stable the camera is, all right? So with this technology, you guys can easily monitor what is going on in your job site every day, 
Okay? So, what is PIN? I'm telling this joke to my students already, but they know <coughs> what I'm about to say. Uh, Kim, K-I-M, Kim, is a very popular surname in South Korea, if you happen to watch the Korean drama. Right? Kim is very popular, okay? It's like Smith in the United States. If you throw the stone to a group of Korean, you have a 50% of a chance to hit Kim. <laughs> okay? Bim is the second most popular surname in South Korea, and our students know that it's a joke. <laughs> there is no such a surname in South Korea like Bim. The building information stands for building information model. And I've been working with one company uh, in the UK, uh, which they call uh, BIM as a building information management. So, people pay more attention to information nowadays as they are using building information model. Okay? So, we're going to be talking about information, a little bit about the building information model. Today, uh, to tell you about the information, I want to show you these uh, pictures. Do you see the difference between these two pictures? What differences do you see? One is modern and the other one is... The one is modern? The other one is here at the... Okay, it has a little bit more uh, nice aesthetic, right? Uh, one is uh, created using building information modeling application and one is uh, created using just a simple 3D uh, CAD modeling application. Okay, the one you see on the right was basically created from using a 3D, uh, 3D Max Studio, and the one on the left hand side was created by Revit. Okay, on the surface, you don't see any differences because it's a nice picture, nice 3D model. Okay, but what is the difference between these two? It's basically coming from this. Uh, it's, it's basically the, the difference between these two is coming from information. The one you sell, the one you saw on the right hand side, it doesn't have any uh, non-graphical information at all. It's just a beautiful picture. On the left hand side, you have information. Okay? And then uh, that information is uh, basically uh, enabling you <coughs> to handle other things, including drawings, including structural analysis, including the, um, the shop drawings, you know, stuff like that, okay? And then, uh, one of the reasons why this technology was gaining uh, sort of a uh, popularity among uh, architecture in the industry is perimeter. Uh, this perimeter is enabling them to build a 3D model as if they are designing the building. And we're going to be talking about it later in more detail. Uh, but speaking of the information, this, you know, in handling information has been going on since 19, uh, early 1990s, even uh, late 1980s, especially in the nuclear power plant industry with the IPIMS. We were handling information with the 3D modeling and stuff like that, you know, from, 19, um, from uh, nine, early 1990s. Okay, so uh, at that stage, the building uh, information model was basically a 3D model combined with information. <coughs> but this is basically, you can say, that that definition of the building information model. Okay, it's a combination of a 3D model and the information. Okay, and then the, technically, if you want to handle information within the 3D uh, object, you have to have uh, some. Uh, object in 3D model. So we, uh, you know, since it has an object, we want to call it object-based 3D computer model combined with information. Okay? Now, for the architects, they came up with the idea of using perimeters. Okay? And then because of these, you know, uh, issues, you know, they were able to pick up some of them from the architects. Okay, so perimeters, what the heck this perimeter is? Take a look at this picture. You have a plan, okay? Now, uh, because a lot of information was embedded in uh, this plan, with one click, you can convert your plan into this 3D model. Okay?
Okay? Now, perimeter is the one that is combined, that is connecting the two dimensional drawings that you saw and this three dimensional model. Okay? So, for example, uh, if you want to do something with the window, for example, you can basically change the size of the window <coughs> for 3D model, like this. Okay? Then, since the perimeter is combining these two dimensional drawings and 3D model, once you change the size of the window, and if you go back to two dimensional drawings, then your drawing is going to be up down there, is going to be changed from here to there automatically because it's a combined through parameters. Okay? So, and then if you want to uh, do something again with the drawings, you can obviously uh, change the size of the window again. And then, then over here, the 3D model is going to be changed like this again. So this is, this is basically uh, how the perimeter is working between two-dimensional drawings and the 3D model. Okay? And because of this nature, we want to call it as uh, object-based uh, parametric 3D computer model combined with information. So we have, in each and every you know, building information modeling application we are using, we have uh, a concept of an object, we have a concept of the perimeter at the same time. Okay? And then, who was delighted with this new concept of using uh, the perimeters? those who are working on the drawings. Okay, if you happen to be working on the design form, okay, this is what's happening. You know, when you finished issuing the first draft of your drawing to your client, the client will be happy, obviously, because you, the first set of the drawing has finished. You know, after looking at their drawing, if they are capable of doing it, they will start telling you, hey, Mr. Designer, I like your design, but, can we change the location of the door? What would you do? Not to lose your client. You will say, yes, I will change the drawings for you. Then you bring that document back to your uh, phone, and then you are asking your associates, hey, Mr. Associate, modify the drawing. Because uh, uh, our client is asking you to replace uh, doors and something like that. And then, then your associates, you know, keep working to update your drawings and you know, stuff like that. And then and you happen to handle, let's say, a uh, hundred pages of the drawings. Okay? At the next meeting, your client happen to change his or her mind again. And then your associates have to fix the drawings one more time. Okay? How many times do they end up doing it? Sometimes more than 20 times. Okay? So what's happening to those associates, they spent more time working on the drafting than working on the design. The drafting is not design, right? The design is about creating the space, drafting is just <coughs> handling the paper. So before this technology, lots of associates <coughs> were spending too much time on drafting so they don't have much time left for the design. So with this BIM technology, finally they found the chance to put more time on design from saving their time from drafting. Because what they can do now is when they change the location of the drawings, the location of the doors in 3D model, automatically the two-dimensional drawings are changed automatically. If you change anything in two-dimensional uh, you know, drawing, then your 3D model is changed. And all other associated drawings are changed at the same time. It's like hallelujah. You don't have to do the same thing over and over again finally. So basically the uh, architects were very, very delighted about this new opportunity. And then uh, it was a GSA. Uh, general uh, service administrators of the federal government who paid attention to this new uh, innovative uh, opportunity and then they claimed that like now from now on if you want to get the project from the federal government you need to use building information modeling technology forget about working with us if you don't use it so it was very a big alum 
to the entire construction industry. Oh my gosh, GSA is now asking us to use the building information modeling technology. What the heck building information modeling is? Why they are happy? Why are they asking us to use that? But it was this is happening like early 2000, you know, late 1990s. So industry all of a sudden started paying attention to, uh, you know, using the building information modeling, you know, stuff like that. And then once, uh, you know, it was architects who picked up this technology first, and then they were happy about it, and they started <coughs> talking about they were using the building information modeling. Uh, to other people at the conferences, you know, places like that. Then there was the contractors who's been watching those architects talking about building information modeling, and then they were like, okay, GSAs pay attention to it. I have a lot of architects working on the building information modeling. Well, okay, do we have anything that we can do using the building information modeling? All right. So we have uh, some advanced uh, companies that started working with the building information modeling. And then uh, this is basically uh, what's happening. Okay, in 2009, Megro Hill uh, did some study, did some research, indicating a tr they tried to understand what benefit uh, the contractors will get from using the building information modeling technology. Okay, so they found about five-ish uh, you know, benefits that the contractors will get from using building information modeling. And then the first benefit, obviously, is this, clash detection. Okay, clash is taking place in the design phase because in the design phase, we have an architect, we have subs, and many entities who are not communicating to each other effectively. Remember, the architects were uh, busy updating their design because of the, the client who's keep changing their mind, right? What is happening at the, uh, at the first stage of issuing the drawing is they issue the drawing not only to the, uh, the contractors, but also they issue that drawing to their subs, specialty contractors, who are specialized in the ducts design and placement, uh, fire sprinkling system design and installation. So they basically received that, the basic drawing from the architects and they started <coughs> designing their uh, duct system, they're designing their air handling unit systems, you know, fire sprinkling systems and stuff like that. But then architects were busy changing their design. Unfortunately, they did not tell all those changes to their subs yet. So there was sort of kind of a miscommunication or disconnected communication going on between those two parties. Subs believed that they were using correct information while they kept changing the design. So at the end of the day, when uh, contractors brought designer subs at the same place, okay, let's open uh, everything that we have done so far. And then they found this. Okay. And then, before using the building information modeling, they happen to find these clashes while they are working on the job site. <coughs> then what they have to do is they have to stop working, try to find out the solution to avoid these clashes. Obviously, that will take time. Slow down the processes. So what general contractors now can do is they can see these clashes in advance in a pre-construction coordination meeting stage and then they have a chance to avoid all those clashes before they have our time on the construction site. <coughs> Save a ton of money. A lot of construction companies saw the benefit almost instantly but they all jumped into using the building information modeling for the clash detection and then we have a company just telling that we been saving millions of dollars. We've been saving 20 days because of detecting these clashes in advance. Because of we don't have to redo many things on the job site. So it was an innovative way of a construction. So there is no reason, you know, there is no reason why they they don't want to use the building information modeling at all. Okay? But that was the first benefit. 
And then the second benefit that they saw was not all clients, uh, not all owners understand how they want to build a building. So with this you know, visual representation of a building, the contractors were able to explain how they want to build the building finally. Especially when you're working on the revamping projects, renovation projects, okay, of the hospital, for example, half of the hospital should be uh, used, should be in operation. You know, nurses and doctors are still using the half of the hospital, and the other half of the hospital is under renovation. Okay, so how can you run your construction processes? seamlessly without bothering what they're doing in the hospital. Okay? So that is very critical issues going on between the contractors and then the owners. And then this visual representation of your project was helping them very nicely uh, you know, having those clients understand what they want to do. And then this is exactly what you guys will do for your class project as well. As the uh, students from construction science department, you will be using a Revit model that you will receive the, from uh, architecture students to uh, visually explain. Okay. So once you have a quantity uh, taken off from the you know, model, obviously you can use it to speed up calculating construction costs, right? And then uh, other uh, benefits that uh, contractors so useful was uh, you know, special coordination. If you have a congested construction site, okay, if the job site is very congested, and if you want to bring many specialty contractors at the same time, uh, you have to handle those as space allocation. Okay? They, uh, each and every uh, specialty <coughs> contractors need a specific space to work on something. They don't want to <coughs> be bothered by any other subcontractors at all. So your job is basically coordinate, like a symphony conductor. You are basically orchestrating a lot of uh, activities going on, which is taking place at the same time, at a different time frame. So that's your job. You're your conductor and manipulating all the resources, all the subs, working on the same place as uh, seamlessly as you can possibly do. Okay? So that's uh, basically where you can get some <coughs> benefits from. You guys can explain how the job site is supposed to be utilized using visual representation very effectively. Other benefit that construction industry is now looking at is the prefabrication. Instead of uh, uh, build everything on the job site, which we call it a stick build, you guys can prefabricate some of the modules elsewhere in a controlled environment. Meaning that you guys keep working, can keep working on something even in the rainy day because you are working inside the house, okay, inside the factory. Right? So you don't have to stop working even in that day. All right, and then once you bring those components to the job site, it's a basically a matter of getting those things assembled very rapidly on the job site. Okay, so it's minimizing the time that you are spending on the job site. It's minimizing the waste of the material that you are using to fabricate. So it's got it's giving you a lot of uh, advantages. So a lot of uh, advanced construction companies are now paying attention to this prefabrication methodology, which was very difficult when you only use a two-dimensional drawings. But thanks to uh, three-dimensional representation of your project, now you have uh, some confidence okay, uh, about the prefabricated methodology. You know that it is working because you saw it in 3D model. So you know that you, you are ready to go and then you start working on this you know, prefabricated methodology. <coughs> The last uh, benefit is a four-dimensional schedule. Now you can even visualize your construction sequence. Okay? If you take a look at the same sequence in the, you know, using the bar chart, uh, you have a hard time to connect what you saw in the bar chart and what is going on in the real you know, construction job site visually. Because you're not 
we have not been working on the construction project for 20 years. Those people working on the job site for 20 years, they have an ability to pick up the boss shot and then understand what will be going on on the job site. For those entry level engineers, you guys have no idea how to how to understand you know thousands of the bot or in the bot shot and understand whether this is the good schedule, this is the schedule that's going to be saving your time, you know, things like that. <coughs> okay? Uh, I guess we can move on this graph. Okay. Uh, on the job site, change my mind. Uh, in the industry, uh, you know, the, the construction industry, we've been talking about productivity uh, many uh, years. Uh, if you want to take a look at the productivity of uh, some industry, including automobile assembly industries, you know, you know, people like that, their productivity was going up since 1964 constantly. So now they can assemble the same car uh, with uh, just half of the time, one third of the time, for example. In construction, uh, the productivity in construction unfortunately has been going down since 1964. Kind of uh, opposite to your, uh, your expectation, right? So since 1964, we've been using lots of a technology. Uh, we've been educating you to become the better constructor, better contractors. But still, what's going on on the job site? Their productivity, <laughs> they're losing their productivity. Okay? There's many reasons for that. And then one of the big reasons is basically they're using, they're wasting their time. Okay? Uh, CII over uh, Austin uh, did one uh, study about you know, how you are spending time on the job site. Okay? In the, uh, 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 in the manufacturing area, manufacturing sector, if you happen to given uh, 100 hours, then uh, you are using uh, 62 hours to add value. You are wasting about 26% of the time. And then this wasting is basically taking place when you're waiting for the part, waiting for people coming in to work with you and you know, stuff like that. Okay? So 62% is basically dedicating you to add value in the manufacturing area. Okay. In construction, in construction, you see how many time is actually going into the hitting the value? Ten percent. All right. Fifty-seven percent. We're wasting time, simply waiting for the material, simply waiting for the uh, the crane coming into the job site, uh, stuff like that. Okay. So. This is basically wasting is taking place in many uh, forms, and one of the <coughs> typical wasting is waiting for other stuff. Okay, so he's been tired of waiting and then actually you know, sleeping on the, you know, the machines. And then unnecessary uh, transport. On the job site, you will see people moving stuff from here to here in the last uh, month. And then you have to decide to move the same stuff from here to here. And then next month you're moving this stuff from here to there. Are we getting any values from doing that? Not at all. Okay, so why are we supposed to be moving those stuff from one location to the <coughs> other? Because it is lack of plan. We didn't see it. Okay, so if we had a chance to see those things in advance, we could avoid those unnecessary transportation of the materials. It is not only about the materials, you can move a people without asking them to uh, add any values at all. You can have people moving from here to there and stuff like that. Okay? Sometimes you uh, did something wrong to, to get some defects, and then obviously whenever you have a defect, you have to get things done again. This is extra process. Okay? This is basically about losing your money. Okay? Sometimes you handle extra materials as well. So, uh, these are basically the reason why you are wasting your time. And then people like to uh, stop wasting their time 
from better utilizing the building information modeling technology in construction. So, we have now people uh, setting up the system even on their job site trailer, looking at the building information model, try to understand how they want to run the project. Okay, you see that those people <coughs> looking at the uh, uh, screen, trying to understand you now what what's what's there, what will be built in one month, and stuff like that. Okay, but since the size of the screen is not kind of a big enough, people sometimes have a hard time to understand, for example, what's behind them, what's on the left hand side. If they want to see what's on the left hand side, what have what has to do, what has to be done is you have to have an operator to rotate the camera here so that you guys can see what's on the left hand side, what's on the right hand side, what's behind you, stuff like that. Okay? Basically, it is not giving you an intuitive uh, opportunity to understand the space. Okay? So understanding the space has something to do with the sense of presence, and this sense of presence has something to do with the field of view. Okay? Now, field of view. When you have a, a small screen like this, you have a small field of view. You don't basically understand much. You have to turn around a lot to understand what's around you. Okay? If you happen to have a little bit more money, you can buy three screens. Then you get a bit wider field of view. Then you have a better chance to understand what's around you. Okay? If you have more money, so that you, you, if you can buy more screen, then you can go like this. Do you get more information from one shot? Okay, so this is basically the impact of a field of a view in terms of looking at the 3D model. Okay, so basically the wider the better, the bigger the better, which is a perfect you know, in the state of Texas. So everything has to be big in Texas, right? <laughs> now, speaking of the, of the field of a view, the ultimate machine giving you uh, best uh, the field of a uh, view is this. Oculus, Oculus Rift. You, know, you see people using this Oculus Rift in often times, okay? And then those people actually using Oculus Rift feel, feel like they're actually on the job site. Like you like roller coasters? I love roller coasters. I love roller coasters. the goggles on? We're going on the roller coaster. what I'm seeing, then you will say, hey, what the heck are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. So, this is a good device for one person getting a field of a, you know, sense of a field, sense of a presence, but construction has to be done by multiple people. So, you have to have a multiple people in the same virtual space. Okay? So, what can we, uh, you know, what we can think about is doing, uh, working on some sort of a second life Thing. So bring everything into uh, the second life, then uh, you might be able to see, you know, the things together. But this is not sort of a, you know, we still have a room to go. We still have to wait until we bring everything into a second life, and then build the building in the second life, and then everybody has a chance to take a look at the same stuff. Okay. So you know, uh, since this is a, you know, kind of a. Uh, a bit to go, and and then and then I was looking at other technology, which is called the cave. 
which is a computer aided, uh, a cave audio video environment, which was basically invented in 1992 by those people uh, in the University of uh, Illinois at Chicago, who came up with the idea of putting people into a cave like this, okay, and then project image around the wall so that the people inside the cube feel like they are actually uh, inside the wall. Okay? And this concept was you know, proven uh, very effective in terms of giving people a better sense of a presence. So other people picked up this idea and then even come up with uh, the cave like this. This is a star cave uh, installed uh, at the University of Southern California and using uh, five walls and then speak <coughs> with fully surrounding people on the job site, okay? But there was, there has been some problems which is basically coming from interoperability issues. Uh, those are good applications, but if you want to see the building information modeling uh, models, which is popular in the construction industry, in their, in, in their uh, cave system, you have to go with the, um, the file uh, conversion process, you know, thing like that, which is uh, taking time. And at the same time, and also, you may, most likely, you may end up losing information from that conversion processes. And the building information model is all about information. And if you lose information, why do we, you know, why do we use the building information model anyway? So. Because of this interoperability issues, uh, the cave system was not that much welcomed by those people working in the construction industry. So, I came up with the idea of using BIM cave, developing the BIM cave, okay? Why don't we mimic what is going on in the cave system using commercial building information modeling application? So I used the you know, InnoGraph report uh, <coughs> to uh, develop you know, our own beam case system and then it is working like this. We have a user and then we have uh, three walls and then uh, we have uh, three computers and then three Navisworks uh, application and then those three uh, Navisworks applications are basically working together to communicate uh, to synchronize the camera location. So I, if I'm asking uh, the central computer to do something then uh, then the, uh, the client computers understand what is going on in the central computer and then synchronize the camera. Okay? So this is basically how the game cave is working and then this is what is actually how the game is working. This is a beam cave number one uh, that, I, that, that I fabricated in Landport Building A. 2011, and I used uh, three computers and the 12 strings to synchronize those uh, you know, the views of the building information model so that people feel like they're actually inside the model. Okay? Then uh, people were asking me, okay, can we uh, put any other screens on top so that we can see those MEP systems and stuff like that? So I did this test to see if we can put any screen on top and then see if it is making any difference. And this test was not that much successful, but we saw some uh, potential thing that we can possibly do. And then other people were asking, hey, Dr. Kang, can you uh, combine this beam cave assistant with the 3D, uh, four-dimensional uh, construction visualization so that we can see the construction sequence in uh, beam cave like this? So we came up with, uh, we added another function into the BMK, so people now can see uh, the sequence of the construction. So basically it allows you to time travel in the cave system, okay? So you can uh, time travel to a certain, uh, in the course of the construction to get a certain stage of the construction, and then start walking around the job site at that stage. And then if you finish you know, understanding what is going on at the stage of the construction, you can resume time traveling to arrive at different stage of the construction. Okay? And then, uh, as I told you, everything in Texas has to be big. So this is not big enough to me. But this is something that I found. Okay? I wanted to basically, uh, you know, 
kind of a surround the entire user like this. Okay, so this is basically the idea that I had uh, when we were uh, putting the Francis Hall under renovation. But unfortunately, there is uh, some space issues, there is uh, some uh, budget issues, you know, stuff like that. So I was not able to uh, get people fully surrounded by, you know, 300 degrees like I planned. Uh, but still, we have uh, something new going on like this. They did their final presentation in the BIM cave, and then I'll have you guys to give the final presentation in the BIM cave as well at the end of this semester. Okay, so uh, students from construction science department will learn how to use this BIM cave, and then uh, then you guys are most likely welcome to join them to give a presentation in the BIM cave. So it's like giving a presentation your, to your client as if you are on the job site. So this is a totally different way of giving a presentation. Okay. So you guys may think how you want to make a more uh, effective presentation uh, from using the building uh, a beam cave, which is uh, different than just using the PowerPoint slide. Okay. So what is the best way to give a presentation in a virtual environment is uh, something that I'd like to challenge you guys. Okay, and then uh, you know having fun is uh, some part of the things that I do with the development of the BIM cave. So uh, at the moment we are using the mouse to control the BIM cave, but this is not fun to me anymore. I, when I was developing the BIM cave, I was excited. When I finished developing something, <coughs> then it's done deal. I'm not excited about it anymore. So I need to keep working on something new to keep me getting excited, and this is what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to put the omni treadmill in the BIM cave, so that you guys can actually walk inside the BIM cave to walk at the gym. Okay. Then, uh, then you might be wondering, how can I control the computers? You know, I don't have a chance to use the mouse anymore, so I'm going to be looking at other technology like this. I'm going to use the band that breathe your muscles. If I do this, it understands what I'm doing. So you remember that I was interested in using factory helmet. I'm trying to see if I can use factory helmet inside uh, the beam cave as well. Okay. Um, let's move on. This is not relevant. Uh, for the um, the oh, this is uh, this is some important. Uh, for the, on the job site, on the on the construction job site, they're using. We have a people using the building information modeling technology for better project control. Okay, and then uh, one of them are using the robotic total station, as I told you. And then uh, Baker Triangle is the company who has been uh, leading the industry in terms of using the you know the building. I mean the robotic total station. So let's take a look at uh, you know those guys who've been working on it and see what he has to say. My name is William Tang. I'm the Director of Virtual Design and Construction for Baker Triangle. Traditionally, uh, laying out the drywall framing and the track lines uh, on, according to the floor plans provided by the designer can take up to maybe two weeks or a week. I mean, it varies between a week and, a, and two weeks. And uh, it takes a crew maybe of four people. You know, you got to have someone to snap a line on one end to the other end and someone reading the plans, you know, relating the information back and forth. 
uh, with the robotic poll station, it took maybe two people. Somebody with the tablet reading the points and somebody marking the, the dots, the locations. The robotic poll station, it locks on to your location where you are with the prism. And uh, the benefit of that is you can walk anywhere on your job site and it'll follow you. The station will tell them where to go and they'll bring the prism pole and eventually find a relative location of where the point is. And the XYZ positioner uh, helps locate that point in a more uh, precise manner. Um, it shifts in both X and, Z, uh, X and Y uh, directions and you can fine tune it to exactly where that location is telling you to go. Uh, utilizing the robotic tool station versus the traditional methods can save you up to 20% of your time. And uh, not to mention, uh, you have the most up-to-date CAD file, or your background, your floor plan, and your guys are laying out exactly what is uh, supposed to be there the first time, instead of having to go back. So. Okay, other innovations going on uh, in the, uh, the, the architecture land. Uh, they were using uh, the building, building information model technology to enhance their uh, design process. Let's move on uh, this thing very quickly. I'd like to show you some of the new uh, trials going on uh, in the end of design. We will have a chance to talk about this later. Uh, we have a people now designing everything in 3D. <coughs> so, uh, working on two-dimensional plan and then converting them into 3D model is going to be uh, uh, the thing of the old school. Okay, in the future, in the future, you, you guys may belong to that generation. Okay, now we will have a people wanting to design everything from 3D. And you guys can communicate between the architects and then the contractors without using any blueprint. Because we have a 3D which has information, why don't we use the 3D to design and to build the building? Okay? So, uh, with this you know, sort of a new technology, <coughs> parametric technology, we have a lot of people doing even more using the parametric nature of the, uh, of the building information model. With this some uh, mathematical equation, you guys can transform a simple uh, geometry into very mathematically complicated model like this. And then architects, believe it or not, started using this concept to design something very unusual like this. Okay, this is a, a transportation hub uh, being built in 9-11, uh, that's in uh, New York. Okay, and then we have a people designing like this. And then, uh, you know, it's a kind of a nightmare for the, um, the you know, contractors because it's not easy to build. But we have a more and more architects designing the building like this. How about this? This is the, um, the Guangzhou Opera House designed by Jaha Hadid, famous female architect from Iraq. Okay. We have uh, this building as well, right? Uh, being built in Abu Dhabi. And then, uh, uh, when the architects are moving towards that way, we have a contractors paying attention to a new technology called the 3D printing. So instead of you know building the building in a traditional way, why don't we just print the building? Okay. Then this thing is very basic at the moment, but you know if you look at the speed of the technology development, if we are doing it like you know last year, maybe 10 years from now, nobody can imagine what's going to be going on using the you know, 3D printer in the construction industry. So you may have to manage how you want to print the house in 10 years, who knows. Okay? We're, I guess, we're running out of time. So I guess I need to uh, stop talking here. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, other benefits going on in the construction industry. Uh, a lot of values you can find from the building information modeling. So. Uh, this semester, we like to have you guys to best utilize this building information model technology through the class project. But those, uh, even those students from the landscape uh, architecture, you guys will have a chance to get some taste of that emerging technology from working with architecture students and construction science students. 
Okay. Having said that, I'd like to wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to my program. Anybody got any questions for Dr. Ken? When, when do you see um, the Ben Cave technology fitting to the greater market? Uh, currently, I am talking with one uh, company who's very, very interested in uh, putting the Ben Cave in their headquarters. If I'm lucky, I may be able to get something done for the company in about a year. Do you think it will move faster on the Ben Cave to the private sector? Once, once, it's like once they, uh, once you see your friend using the beam cable, then they will be now. Is it, is it just one big while or is it just an extra Okay, hey folks, hey, the question, the question was, in the beam cave, is it just one file uh, or, or is it multiple files uh, putting on the same uh, wall? Uh, the answer is, we are using nine computers in the beam lab, okay? And then those nine computers have the same model loaded, okay? And then we have uh, some application controlling those nine computers, nine uh, identical models, working together <coughs> synchronously, so that you guys feel like you are actually, you know, kind of sitting inside the model. <coughs> Any other questions? All right.